All right, so good music tonight. Let's see if we can get some good preaching in here. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Let's take our Bibles and open them to the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and verse 27. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27. Where we learn a little bit about ourselves and every other human on the planet in this one single verse. Let's check this out. Genesis chapter 1. If you're having trouble finding that, it's going to be the first book in your Bible. Probably on the first page. Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and Female. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, your design of humanity is awesome, and it astounds our hearts to think that we are made in your image, and all that that entails for our lives and how we should view and treat each other. So I pray tonight, God, as we look into your word on this matter that is so divisive right now, that is that is so overwhelming that we, your people, at least here, might be equipped in the truth as to how we should view others and how we should view prevailing ideologies against your truth in these days, Lord. So help us, we pray. Train us, we pray. And guide us in your truth tonight and lead us to yourself that we might see more of your glory and more of what your cross means for us each and every one and that we might point others to you for the healing they need. So I pray whether... Whether it is in person here among us today or online, may you touch our hearts and may you do that in us that only you can do. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. So tonight we come to a very special time in the life of our church family. And that is the evening following the observance of the Lord's Supper. Now, normally my practice, and it's going to be no different tonight, <coughs> is to take this evening to look at a great doctrine of our faith in the Bible that we might be trained, that we might be equipped, and that we might take in the whole counsel of God. And tonight, we are looking at the very emotionally charged, very culturally passionate issue of racism. And we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about how we are to view others according to their skin color of all things and what that means. So let me offer you here as we begin our confessional statement on the issue of racism. This comes from the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 and Article 15. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just this portion of it. It says that all Christians are under obligation to seek to make the will of Christ supreme in our own lives and in human history means and methods used for the improvement of society and the establishment of righteousness among men can be truly and permanently helpful only when they are rooted in the regeneration of the individual by the saving grace of God in Jesus Christ. What that means in a nutshell is we do not believe that we can place Christ as central of our lives or central in human history if we are not Born again believers in him to do so. So you can't just go out and do a lot of good works and think that that's impacting culture for Christ. You, you can't rely on any good work for that matter. Uh, what you have to do is have this rooted in your heart through the new birth that comes through Christ. And the very first thing we say after that is this. In the spirit of Christ, Christians should oppose racism. In the spirit of Christ, Christians should oppose racism. This statement is simply setting forth what we see in the Bible, that racism is an anti-Christ work of the flesh, a tool of Satan to not merely divide people in any given land, but primarily to disrupt and to deny the work of Christ in the hearts and lives of men. And only the work of Christ can overcome it totally in our lives and in our culture. So this is a very big issue for us all and for our ministry as we move forward 
into the future seeking to make Christ known both in our families and our neighbors and our neighborhoods and our communities and in our world. And I want us to be equipped to understand the prevailing racist winds that are flowing through our culture right now that will probably be very surprising to you as you learn about them tonight that we might stand fast against it by standing on the word of God and the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's begin as we look first this evening at creation's directive to deny racism. And we go back here to our verse tonight, Genesis 1 and verse 27. So God created man in his own image. He created them in the image of God. He created them male and female. Wow. What a verse. Okay? Now, I know it's very easy sometimes to read through pages of the Bible and not get really hit or impacted by what you just heard. But this is an amazing fundamental verse that tells us where we're from and who we are and how we should act. And it all centers on this reality that we are made in the image of God. And when I say we, just let me clarify this for you tonight. There are not several different races on the planet. Okay? There's not a black race. There's not a yellow race. There's not a white race. There's not any of those. There's one race. And that one race is humanity. So if you are human, you belong to this one race, and this one race is made in the image of God. Amen. That is a huge, huge reality that defines everything for us. So as we used to say, red or yellow, black or white, they're all precious in his sight. doesn't matter if you're born or girl. All of us are made in the image of God. God. Now, brothers and sisters, it's this designation that separates us from the rest of creation. We are made in the image of God. Now, some folks, maybe you're one of them, some folks like to think that what separates us from the animal kingdom is that we have spirits and they don't. There's just one big problem with that when you actually read the Bible. Here's the issue. You may, you may be able to look at it while you're on this page. But if you look in, in chapter 1 and verse 31 of Genesis, you will read this. That God speaks about the animals here. He, he speaks of them in these terms. Everything having the breath of life in it. Now that word in Hebrew is nefesh. So it is saying everything having nefesh, the breath of life in it. And then when you read of Adam in chapter 2 and verse 7, Adam is spoken of there as being a living being. But you want to take a guess at the Hebrew word that is translated there for living being. It's the same word in the fish. So when you read through the Bible, there's not a distinction between animal kind and mankind based on they, have, they don't have spirits and we do. That's not a biblical distinction. What separates us completely and totally from all creation, animals and angels alike, what separates us from them all is that we are made in the image of God and they are not. Amen. Okay? So that's the heart of of what's going on here. Now, what does it mean that we are made in the image of God? Is this what God looks like? No. Middle-aged white guy? <laughs> you know, balding? Is this, I don't think that's what he's referring to there. To be made in the image of God means that we relate to God in a way that no other creature can. We are spiritually able to relate to God. Now, if you've seen all of movies, uh, what was that big Christian trilogy that uh, Tolkien wrote? Uh, you know, they're, when they're going through the forest in that movie, you see these huge statues all across the land, and those statues are images of their of their their kings and whatnot. That's that's kind of describing what it means to be made in the image of God. We are God's stamp on creation. We are his representatives here. It is to us, he says, hey, you go forth and you subdue this creation. And as you are made in my image, when you go forth representing me, this means that when you are living as you should live, all men should be able to see something of God in you. And we should be able to see something of God's goodness, something of God's kindness, something of God's justice, something of God's truth, something of God's mercy in us 
as we represent him on this planet. This is, these are the things it means to be created in the image of God. And as creatures made in the image of God, we relate to one another in a very special way. Doesn't matter again. Doesn't it does not matter if you are black or yellow, red, white. It does not matter. If you are human, you are made in the image of God, and we relate to each other in a very special way, so that we owe one another as image bearers of God mutual care and respect and honor and dignity. We see this all across the Bible. We do not murder one another. Why? Because we are made in God's image. Our lives are sacred. So you don't just run around killing everybody. James says in James 3 9 that we don't curse one another. Why? Because we are made in God's likeness. Same thing. We do not harbor thoughts of others being inferior to us and we being superior to them because of the color of their skin, because we are all made in the image of God. And therefore, we must view and hold our thoughts and opinions under the sway of God's truth. Amen. We are all made in His image. And this is so critical for us to hold to because, quite frankly, our history is not altogether that wonderful regarding this. You know, there was a time, even in our nation, I want to even go through the other nations of the world and their history. We don't have time for that. We just, we just talk about us. There was a time in our nation when Christians held to slavery being okay in the form that it was taken at that time because the Bible never forbids slavery. It never forbids it. Now, granted, the, the slavery you see in the Bible, quite a bit different from the slavery you see in the slave trade. Okay? In, in the Bible, a slave could earn their freedom. A slave could even become part of your family. Uh, a, a slave was sort of embraced as someone very special. Uh, during the days of the slave trade, not so much. So a lot of Christians had problem with that. And when they really couldn't, they really couldn't uh, succumb to that idea, here's what they said. And this happened, this happened even in a... This is, this is why, dear friends, there is, an, there is an American Baptist Convention and there is a Southern Baptist Convention. And that Southern Baptist Convention was occurring over the slave issue. Just being straight with you. You can look up all that history. And here was the thing. There were slaveholders in the South that said, we are able to hold slaves because the black man is not made in God's image. And we are. So we've got a little sorted history with this. Now don't get me wrong. Our convention has put out resolution after resolution after resolution uh, about how that was an atrocious error on our behalf. And we've repented from it and we've, we've turned from it. But this is why we cannot let the fact that we are made in the image of God escape us or be denied or denied by us. Because when that happens, all manner of atrocity is opened up. You want to you take a look back at, at Nazi Germany? Why is it that they could gas so many Jews without repercussion? It's because those Jews weren't truly human to them. See, when you take away the humanness of a human and you, at the core you have to deny they are not made in God's image and everything's open, they're just like a deer you go out and kill and skin and eat. We don't want to go there. The Bible will not allow us to go there, to treat others in an animalistic way. So creation itself gives us a strong directive to deny racism. Now secondly tonight, let me show you here that the cross has a directive as well. And we see here the cross is directed to deny racism. And I, I want to take you here to a few texts across the New Testament that show us this in black and white. Let's just start with John 3.16 because we all know that and we all have it memorized. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. That was a huge thing for the Jew to hear. Because the Jew was cool with salvation coming to them, 
not so cool with salvation going to the Gentile. And here Jesus steps up and says, oh no, it's anybody, anybody who repents, anybody who places faith in me will be saved. That's why the Father has sent me. And by the way, in the Bible, the, the main racist divide was pretty much singularly between Jew and Gentile. They really didn't battle a lot of the racial divides you and I are facing right now. It was all Jew and Gentile. And Christ more than sufficiently took care of that issue by his cross. He says, I am given for all mankind that all may have my salvation. And we see that also in Matthew 28, 19, where we are told that we are to make disciples of who? All the nations. Literally, all the ethnos. All the ethnicities. That's that literal word in the Greek. Everybody on the planet, Christ has died for them to have salvation. Then you have Acts 15, 9, where the early church and the apostles are debating what to do with the Gentile believers. And it is written there that after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. That's about as plain as it gets. God has demolished all dividing walls between nations, between cultures, and they've all been dissolved by the blood of Christ. And to top this thought off, I want to get in here one of my favorite scriptures from Revelation 7-9. Where John says, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that nobody can number from every nation and all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. I love that verse. Yes. Because it's just showing the totality of Christ's salvation going to the entire planet. Amen. Amen. Thank God. This is the church. This is the blood-bought church of Christ gathered together as one through the blood of Jesus. An old Scottish preacher, and I will not say this in a Scottish accent, sorry, but his name was Alexander Stewart. He puts all of this in perspective when he says, quote, The blood which flows from the veins of the Hottentot or springs under the lash from the back of an American slave is that one same blood which flows in the veins of the Son of God. Amen. That's right. An old professor at Southern Seminary Stephen Wellman, I never had him, but I respected him. He says, quote, How we treat one another as the church, especially in terms of race, ultimately bears witness to the truthfulness and power of the gospel. In such a racially divided and fallen world, it is imperative for the church to be the church. Before a watching world and angelic host, we must live out the power of the gospel for the glory of God as a testimony to all people of the truth of who we are, regardless of our race, by virtue of our creation, and by God's grace, what we may become by faith in Christ. That was written 20 years ago. And it's all a matter of the heart, then, when it comes to racism. Now, uh, I'm, not, I'm not, I will not insult your intelligence, but I just want to, I want to repeat that so that we all grab a hold of it. Racism is born out of the heart, okay? It comes from the heart. You must decide that some group is inferior to you and you're superior to them. And that's right out of the heart. And of course, that can't be a Christian heart. It can't be an issue like that. And, and you know, uh, children, if you watch children when they're young, you know, racism is a taught thing. It feeds off of our sin nature, but it's a taught thing. And I can distinctly remember when I was growing up, 
there, there were no black people, there were no people of any color in the town that I grew up in, and the most exposure I had to black people was the Jeffersons. And, and don't get me wrong, I mean, Weezy and all that group, I'm, I'm, I'm down with them to this day. Uh, and that was fine, and I never will forget one time, uh, because this has become such an issue here lately, uh, I was with my mother at Kmart. Now, I don't remember this. I was too little, but, but Mom has told me about it on more than one occasion. And we were in the Kmart in Madisonville, Kentucky, and I was running around like a little heathen kid would do. And I, I come around this aisle real quick, and I, I start to bolt down the aisle, and I look back to see if Mom's chasing after me, and I run into this, this black woman. And I fall flat on the ground like this, and I'm looking up at her, and Mom says that I look up at her and I say, Aunt Jemima! And of course, Mom is about to die. You know, she, she is about to crow right there on the spot. But uh, the black lady thought it was hilarious <laughs> and tried to help me up. These, these are things that have to be learned when you get into racism. And it's all a matter of the heart. And I stress that because if you're wondering why we have this wildfire issue of racism right now in our nation, it's because racism has now been defined as not something in your heart. You define it just by who you are. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. According to the new definition, and it's called critical race theory. And it's just a watered-down form of Marxism that wants to eliminate all distinctions among mankind in, in class, uh, social class, economic class. They call it race. I've already told you there's only one race. Uh, they want all, even gender. If you've wondered about the gender thing, like where did that spring from? Remember here a few years back when Target was going nuts letting dudes into women's bathrooms and identifying as this gender and that gender, it all springs from the same thing, all out of the same school. And now it is hit home with racism. So, here's the thing. You didn't know this coming in here tonight, so this may be shocking to you, but you, everybody I'm looking at here tonight, according to the new definition, you are all racists. I'm a racist, and here's why. I am white, middle class, uh, able-bodied, and, if we're being truthful, evangelical. So we are racist by default in this new system. Now you may not have anything at all in your heart against anybody of any color, but the new definition is you do. Because you support a culture of racism, according to them, that is oppressive. So you and I are oppressors. We can do nothing right. They are the oppressed. They can do nothing wrong. And if you don't think it's taken off, take a look at all the statues that are coming down overnight. The, the racism issue has, has always been with us, but the speed at which this is moving should catch all of our attention. And you'll hear it sometimes as I said in, in CRT, critical race theory, or you'll hear it in intersectionality, or words like that, and it's saying that we are oppressive by our laws and our legislations and our media and everything else against people of color, and we all support this, whether or not we handle from the heart. I got a touch of this a few years ago. We had a little girl at our house, and I can't even remember what the discussion was about, but... Uh, I said something about using black paper or using white paper or something like that. And I'll never I'll forget, this little, I mean, little kid, she snaps around all of a sudden and she says, you are such a racist. And I said, probably not since two of my kids are half Hispanic, but okay, if you need to go with that. And I, never, I couldn't figure out like where the heart of that come from. I couldn't understand where that really, really was coming from, but she was already indoctrinated in this. She just didn't realize she was racist too. But she's white, middle class, able-bodied, 
and everything else. So we're left with a big problem here. And you can see, you can see how this can really be used of Satan to bring about great destruction. Okay? Like a year from now, if this keeps going this way, a year from now, do you think preachers are going to get up and preach a sermon like this without repercussion? Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, this, this whole church has a real racist problem because we're predominantly white, we're predominantly middle class, we're predominantly able-bodied, we're predominantly evangelical, so of all people around us, we're really bad. Doesn't matter how much good you've done. Doesn't even matter if you have hate in your heart or not. Just by virtue of who you are. Now let me let me just sort of break out where this really starts to come into play. So we've seen lately a, a lot of police interaction, racial tensions happening. You know, we uh, you know we had that case, the George Floyd case where the, the cop was on the neck of the guy for like nine minutes or something and suffocated and he died. So you have that deal. Then we have a case just this last week in the last few days. You know, a guy steals a taser off of a cop, starts running, shoots the cop while he's running, and the guy gets mowed down by the cops because of, a, of an attack with a deadly weapon. Uh, obviously, obviously, that's what should have happened. But evidently, those in the justice system don't see it that way. Why? Because the cop was an oppressor and can do nothing right. And the oppressed can do nothing wrong. So now you've got an entire city that's about to go up in flames because cops are sitting there looking like, if I have to use my weapon in self-defense, am I going to be on a jury trial for felony murder? So they're not even coming in. Frankly, I don't blame them. Amen. Now here's the thing. Do you have some cops that are racially motivated? Of course. Hey, they're, they're human just like any other humans. They, they have these passions and sinful feelings just like all of us do. And it may not pour out in racism for us, but it may pour out in racism for them. And you're going to have some that will use their badge as a means to carry out their homicidal desire. But you've got other cops that are just looking to get through their shift and do their job and uphold the law and come home that night and do it again the next day. Yeah. Percentages? I don't know. I don't get into statistics or anything like that. But we know by human nature that that is to be the case. So if we sort of fast forward this and see how great of a tool Satan can use this to be. Let me offer this one to you. In the black community in America, 75%, 75% of, of black families are living without fathers in the home. That's a problem. That's an issue. I don't know how many white families are without fathers. A bunch. But we're, we'll just use this because I, I have this figure for sure. 75% of families living in a black fathers in the home. Now, if a, if a black man steps up in this culture and he says, this is a problem and we need to fix it, then he is going to be told, hey, this isn't your fault. He's going to be told, this is the problem of living under the man. Guess who's the man? You're the man. White, middle-aged, heterosexual, able-bodied, evangelicals. You and me. So let's say I stand up and say, hey, this is a problem and it needs to be fixed. Well, they're going to look at me and say, you're the problem. You're the issue. You're the reason this is happening. And I'm standing there and I'm like, I didn't impregnate any of these women. I didn't make a baby with any of these women and run away. I didn't do any of that. How am I at fault? And at the end of the day, guess what happens? Nothing. Nothing. Because I can't fix it. And they're being told it's not their problem to fix. Now, transfer that into the church. 
Go, just go a year ahead, one year ahead in time. I mean, you've, you've already seen, right, the, the biggest carriers of the virus in America are surely churches, right? Because we got two or three plastered on the news every night. This church met together, and now a whole community is dying of the road, and all, all where it's definitely an evangelical problem. So we're already on the radar. But let's go a year forward, and we're just talking about just say the Ten Commandments. Well, now, all of a sudden, the Ten Commandments aren't your fault either. And not only are they not your fault, it is offensive. It is degrading that somebody would dare preach that you're in sin because of these commandments that you're breaking. A lot can happen in a year, folks. I don't know what will happen. I just know a lot can happen and a lot has happened. And it's nothing new. It is nothing new. You can go back to the first two humans. And we were doing this. Why did you eat of that fruit, Adam? Ah, this woman that you gave me, she took the fruit and I ate from it. For all I knew, it was a fruit off some other tree. It's not my fault. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. And ultimately, where this thinking goes is it cuts off people from the gospel of God's grace. Where Christ could come in and do the healing he can only do. So we have to oppose all forms of racism to avoid this catastrophe. And brothers and sisters, we have to oppose all wicked philosophies that support this as well. Amen. You have to know what those are. I've shared those a little bit tonight. Continue to look them up. Continue to learn about them. And I want to end tonight with a story that I'm not ultra proud about, but I am very thankful for. Some years ago when I was in high school, our local schools consolidated into two big schools in the county. So I think they took eight local high schools and made, made them into two. And they called one north and they called one south, even though they're only about five miles apart from each other. And they need to be five miles apart because we can build the best basketball team we can if people can easily go from one school to the other. So we, we want the best, the best program we can make. Now, when I went to this high school, uh, I was from Bremen. And all of us Bremen boys stuck together. And we were all tight. And... Uh, we're thrust into this new school. There's a lot of people from different towns. We kind of sort of knew, but not really. And for the first time in our lives, we are now going to school with black students. And I don't know what the deal was. I really don't. But one of the Bremen boys had some problem with one of the black guys, and I'm sure it had something to do with something very serious like a girl or something like that. And these, this tension just built and built and built and built and built. And one morning we go to school and we're all walking through the halls together. And this war between the Bremen boys and a lot of the black students just erupts. And it just opens up. And we just got into some very bad things that we shouldn't have that morning. And this sort of was a cloud that hovered over us for pretty well the rest of our high school time. That happened when I was a freshman. So for the next four years, we're still dealing with this. We're still going on with it. And a lot of the guys who started it in the first place, they graduated and gone on. And now the rest of us had two more years to kind of deal with this. And we, you know, we never... They would never come to our end of the county uh, alone. We would never go into there. It was just bad. It was just bad. I'm not proud of that at all. Because, of course, at heart, guess what? We were all Baptists. Every one of us. White or black. It didn't matter. We were all Baptists. And in typical Baptist style, we were fighting. And there was one, one student, though, 
that I actually had a class with. His name was Brian, but everybody called him Swish. <laughs> I don't know why they called him Swish, but we all called him Swish. And I never will forget it. I, I, I still see it in my mind's eye like it happened today. Fast forward now, I'm, I'm like, uh, me and Brian both were like 22, uh, 23 years old, I think, and we, I'm, I'm walking down the dorms at Southern Seminary, and around the corner comes this guy, and I look at him, and I say, swish, and he looks at me and he says, hey, Michael, and we go up to other, each other, and we hug, and we embrace, and we started a relationship then that carries on to this day. He's a pastor in Texas now. I'm a pastor in Woodsville. We are both a long way away from Gilbert County. And uh, we, we began a, a, a brotherhood there that existed four years before, or six years before, or however many years that would have been. Uh, but we're still, we're still tied. And I offer that because there was a time where our hearts were wrong. That Christ healed those hearts to where there was no longer animosity one for another. There was now love and brotherhood for one another. And that all comes through the life, heart-changing power of Jesus Christ. Amen. To this day, I would never think that He was that he had any feeling against me other than what came over his heart. And I know he doesn't think that about me. We would never say, you're a racist because of the culture you live in. He would never say that to me. And what I'm saying to us all is, we can't buy into that lie. If you're a racist, you are a racist because of your heart. Not because of where you were raised. And not because of where you live. I'm very thankful for Brian to this day. So, my friends, I just offer you that to show what Christ can do. Amen. The healing power that Jesus gives hearts that will be open and humbled before Him. Amen. So as our musicians come tonight and we have this time of invitation, I I just want to lay it out. And I don't, I for for the life of me, I have I have never heard the, so much as the slightest racist slur from any of you. But if it's in your heart, you need to deal with it before God. If you're watching this on Facebook and this is in your heart, you need to deal with it with God. And, and you need to do that now because it is a completely anti-Christ, anti-gospel belief to have. So let's go to our Lord in prayer. Let's pray He would do that healing in us that only He can do. Father... I thank you for this time tonight and I thank you for the richness of your word and the reality and all that it means that we are made in your image. And I'm thankful as I've seen in my own life that you truly do break down every wall, that uh, your blood dissolves the most divisive walls that we can put up. And I pray as we go forward, Lord, that you would help us, your people, to march forward in truth and love. And to check our hearts all the time. And to be sure that we are not buying into philosophies of the world that will divide your church. And separate us one from another. Help us, Lord, to stay firmly together in this time. And to march forward with your heart and with your truth being the ground beneath our feet. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.